Welcome to Dream It Live. We have a great panel of experts with us today who made time out of their day for us, which is greatly appreciated. Well, let me tell you where not to start, and that's with the Magic Quadrant. We have the world's best mousetrap. See, I have a business model advantage and a pricing advantage. Let's go back and forth. We're talking about going from secondary school to university. Hi. I'm Steve Barsh, a managing partner at Dream Adventures, and welcome to Dream It Live. On today's show, we have Annie Duke. Annie is an author, corporate speaker, consultant in the decision-making space. Her first mainstream book was Thinking of Bets, and there's another one coming we'll talk about at the end of the show, which quickly became a national bestseller. And Annie, just so you know, I think I've bought about 12 to 14 copies of it that I've given it to so many people. It's such a great book. She's a former professional poker player. She won more than $4 million in tournament poker. Annie won a World Series of Poker bracelet and is the only woman to have won the World Series of Poker Tournament of Champions and the NBC National Poker Heads Up Championship. On today's show, with a particular focus on these very challenging times, we're gonna talk about key lessons learned for poker and how it's like business, but chess is not. We'll talk about that every decision is a bet. We're gonna get into that a lot. Talk about embracing uncertainty, and there's certainly a lot of that these days. How do you embrace uncertainty when you're trying to make decisions? We'll talk about dealing with decision, making decisions with a lot of bias around because there's always bias in decision making. Learning from your successes and your mistakes and applying all of this to challenging times. If you have a question or a comment, if you strongly agree or agree, excuse me, if you have a question or a comment and you strongly agree or disagree, please put them in the comments section, whether you're watching on YouTube or LinkedIn. We're gonna leave 10 minutes at the end and take your questions live with Annie. So in the interim, let's dive in. Annie, welcome to Dream It Live. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I mean, speaking of uncertainty, we, we know, know what happened last week when there was a storm and the power got knocked out. So it's I'm happy crazy. we could schedule so quickly. Yes. No. Thank you for letting us. Uh, thank you for letting us back uh, into your schedule. Certainly for that. So I just want to find out first from I. I gave your quick bio. By the way, I'm streaming from Philly today. Dustin's producing from Philly. I assume you're in Philly today, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I'm outside of Philly, yeah. Outside of Philly, and that's where you're streaming from. Did I miss anything in your bio? You have such a rich, strong background, I wanna make sure I didn't miss anything. I would say the only thing is like, uh, you know, I just have this weird bona fide of uh, having done PhD work at UPenn um, yep. in cognitive psychology. So uh, before I became a professional poker player, I was on my way to become a professor in cognitive psychology, thinking about uh, learning, um, in particular, how do people learn? So uh, I kind—I never really lost my interest. What I found was that poker was just a really super interesting laboratory for right. kind of studying the concepts that I was learning when I was actually when I was actually at Penn. Um, so I think that I was just—you know—it's one of the ways that luck influenced my life really well. That I had this collision of these two, you know, this very real-world problem I was dealing with, and then also the academic background that. I, I've sort of thought about how do you merge those together and get those to speak to each other in a kind of interesting way. In in all of our conversations, by the way, I have a feeling that the term luck is going to come up a lot <laughs> as we talk about this. It's interesting. I was lucky. Was, ah. Anyway, so we'll get into that. So let, let's get into our first topic. I want to hear our first topic. Could you, and again, I know that you have a very strong educational background. I think it was PhD level work at Penn and cognitive psychology you were doing at the time, and then you transitioned. As you got into poker, because I know a lot of it will come from cognitive psychology and poker and decision making, can you just talk about briefly, what were the first, um, what were the top three things you learned from playing poker, whether that's about decision making, cognitive psychology, you know, top mistakes people make, that type of thing? Yeah, so learn is such an interesting word here. There, there are concepts that I sort of had to learn how to deal with. Um, ways that I learned how to deal with them. This is a, you know, kind of broad. And then things that I thought were kind of interesting about the things that I thought I knew about learning that really poker showed me that I didn't know. So I'll, I'll kind of try to pick from those different topics. So mm -hmm. the number one thing that that really struck me when I got into poker was that really like even in any like intro level psychology class, they teach you that learning occurs when you have lots of feedback tied closely in time to decisions and actions. So you think about like a rat in a Skinner box, presses a lever, you know, a, a food pellet comes out, they press a lever again, a food pellet comes out, they do that enough times, there's enough iterations of that, and they learn that lever pressing produces food. Um, and this is really kind of, you know, in some ways dogma within within psychology that this is the way that that this happens. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, if I 
could design a human activity where there's lots and lots of feedback tied closely in time to decisions and actions, it would really be poker. Um, you get to make or observe uh, at a live poker game up to about 200 decisions an hour. Um, wow. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a lot. Well, because each each hand has up to 20 decision points. You get about 30 hands in an, an hour, uh, 30 hands in a half hour. So you're getting about 60 hands in an hour. Obviously, most most hands don't have all of those 20 decision points. But, you know, right. I, I do something and then you do something and then I do something, then you do something. And then even if I'm not in the hand, I'm watching other people do that stuff. So and then after everything that I do, I get I get an immediate response. If I call, I see immediately whether you call me back or whether you raise me or whether you fold me, uh, whether you fold against me, despite whether I get to see the cards or not. Right. So. Right. Um, so it's, it's lots of feedback and it's like really, really fast. It's like this very, very tight and closed feedback loop. Mm -hmm. um, and what I noticed was that here I was new and I was coming, I was playing against people who were very experienced and I was watching them make the same mistakes over and over again and like literally learn nothing from their experience as far as mm -hmm. I could, um, or at least take sort of the wrong lessons. And um, so I, that was really, for me, the motivation for getting into, really getting into this topic really deeply and starting to really think about it and write about it. Ultimately, it was, it was why I wrote Thinking in Bats because that was that really presented a big problem for me. So we, we can talk about exactly what's going wrong there. But that was the first thing was like, what is going on? Why are people not learning in this environment where you're getting so much feedback? Right. The, the second thing uh, that I had to learn as a poker player was um, how to really be comfortable with the luck element that that you can't control the cards that are going to come. And if something is bad is going to happen to you 2% of the time, it's going to happen to you 2% of the time. Right. So, right. so you have to really get used to that and you have to really try to figure out how to work within that environment. And then the, the, the thing that's related to that, which would be number three, which I think is really important. And this all relates back to the first problem is you have to be really, really careful about how easy it is to fool yourself. So, the thing that's really interesting about poker is that when you win or lose a hand, it's not immediately obvious why. Mm -hmm. It could be because you had bad luck. It could be because the other player played quite poorly and got lucky. But right. it could be that you actually made choices that were not optimal within the hand. And trying to figure out what's up with that is actually incredibly hard to do. And mm -hmm. how do you kind of set up, how do you first of all understand what the big traps are? But also then how do you set up systems to sort of protect yourself against that so that you can get, you can be more objective about thinking about what your contribution to the outcomes, you know, at the table are that you then obviously can take into greater lessons. Got it. Got it. Let's transition because you started to talk about luck and a lot of things you talked about. Let's transition to the next topic. I know you talk a lot about that business and life is poker, not chess. So could you talk about that? Like, what do you mean by that statement that business and life is poker not chess? Yeah, so um, actually we can go back to the idea of like a learning occurs when you have lots of feedback tied closely sure. to decisions and actions. That's true if you're playing chess. Mm -hmm. So uh, when the way that something turns out is a, re is a direct result, like really closely tied to the thing that you did, then when you have an experience, things went well, things didn't, I got... I lost at the game of chess, I didn't. You can now tie it back and say, I know that this is because I made good decisions or bad decisions because mm -hmm. the only influence on the way that something turns out is your skill, or at right. least that would be the strongest influence. So okay. if you think about a game like chess, um, there's no super strong influence of luck in, in the sense that like you don't, you don't roll you know, a pair of dice and then like it comes up seven and you get you know, an extra queen but if it comes up snake eyes, like it's checkmate, right? Yeah, or very good, right. gone or right. something like that. So right. there, there are some influences of luck, but they're, they're not, not in that same way. The pieces are going to stay where they are until you move them through an active skill. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that's kind of missing from chess in a, in a really strong way would be hidden information. Um, I can see where all your pieces are. Mm -hmm. I know where they are. So I know that if I make a particular move, the pieces, your pieces aren't going to randomly move. Nobody's going to move mine without me choosing to. 
and I know what all your possible responses are. So what that means is that if all I know about a game of chess is that like Steve, that you you beat Dustin or somebody, right. you know, like, right. um, and that's the only thing I know, and I didn't watch any of the game. I know that you made better decisions in that game than Dustin is. In other words, I can work backwards from the outcome to to what the underlying quality of the decision is. Yeah. That's very not lifelike. So so poker, obviously, there's a very strong influence of luck, right? Like I can't control the card that is to come. Right. So I could have a hand where the only way I can lose is if the queen of clubs hits. Right. And the dealer deals out a queen of clubs. What am I going to do? Right. right. Um, so that's the first thing. But then the second thing is there's this really strong influence of hidden information. I, I can't see your cards. Right. So I'm always guessing at what your your cards are. So so what that means is that if I have the same information, Steve, you beat Dustin playing an hour of poker with with him. Mm -hmm actually don't know anything about your underlying decision quality, right? Like, cause you could have won because you got lucky. Right. So that makes it incredibly hard to work backwards from um, the quality of the outcome to the quality of the decision. And this sets up what I, what I refer to in the new book as the paradox of experience that the only way we can learn is from experience, but an individual experience can really get in the way of learning because it's not like chess. I can't say you lost. So therefore, Right. You know, your decision quality wasn't good. And the problem is that there's all sorts of ways that we kind of don't recognize how loose that relationship is mm -hmm. between the quality of the outcome and the quality of the decision in the short run. Obviously, in the long run, with a large enough sample size, you know quite a bit. But in the short run, off of an N of one or two or three, mm -hmm. we don't really know very much. But our brains make like trick us into thinking that we know a ton about it. And that it, that's like one of the biggest problems for people learning in poker. It's one of the biggest problems for people figuring out, you know, how am I supposed to learn from my own experiences or as I'm yeah. watching, you know, other entrepreneurs or other people in business, like what are the lessons I'm supposed to take from the successes or the failures? It really uh, befuddles like all of our decision making. Right, so, so like you had said, and I'll just tie it back, you know, so business is a game of incomplete information Yep. And luck. Life is, right? Incomplete information and luck. So if we tie that back and we're going to get more into startups and entrepreneurship, but I want to go back to one of the reasons you, you know, we wanted you on the show and you agreed to be on and we really appreciate it is given these challenging times for people in business, how do I apply this thinking? And we're going to dive into it even deeper, but how do I apply this, you know, businesses like life and uh, sorry, business and life is like poker, not chess. So it's challenging and I don't have complete information. Any advice or thoughts? And again, we'll get really deep into it a little later in the show, but any initial thoughts? Yeah, so thank, that's a, thank you for that question. Um, the, what I would, the first thing that I would say is just in general, kind of an umbrella statement, you're much better off if you embrace the uncertainty than mm -hmm. if you try to pretend it doesn't exist. Right. So one of the things I've been trying to explain to people about like this moment in time right now is what coronavirus, what the pandemic has done is made uncertainty slap us in the face, right? Like right. we know that we know very, very little about the virus. We, we hardly even know what like the transmission rate is. Like it's, right. we, you know, who knows when a vaccine is going to come. It, right. It's just, and then as far as like what's happening with the economics, again, it, it's just very hard to predict, you know, is work mm -hmm. from home going to be a thing that continues? Is, is school from home going to be a thing that continues? Um, right. What is the recovery going to look like? I mean, there, obviously, it's just all over the place. And we can really see that there's a whole bunch of stuff we don't know. There's a whole bunch of stuff we know we don't know. And then mm -hmm. a bunch of stuff that we know we don't know we don't know. Like it just goes, right. we can iterate that out. And right. that there's a whole bunch of luck. And so people are saying to me, okay, so now things are really uncertain. How do I make decisions? And what I'm trying to explain is the world that you thought was stable before, because that's what they tie it to. You can tell me how to make decisions now, but how's that going to help me when things go back to being stable? Mm -hmm. They say that was an illusion. You thought the world was stable. You thought ah. you were better at predicting things. Right. But the world that you thought the world was like over here, like pretty certain. Mm -hmm. And then here's COVID where it's really, really, really uncertain. Right. But this is where you thought the world was, but it was actually like here. There's mm -hmm. like a very small gap. And I can prove it to you by just asking, do you own stocks and bonds at the same time? Right. Yes. And if your answer to that is yes, 
then right. you're implicitly admitting that the future is incredibly hard to predict. Mm, so, so I think that the biggest thing to understand is that I think that in terms of the learning opportunity that, mm -hmm. that COVID-19 presents us, it gives us that opportunity to say, okay, we can't run away and hide. We can't mm -hmm. pretend this uncertainty doesn't exist. So if we can figure out how to make good decisions within this environment, and then remember those lessons. It's going to make us so much better when everybody else goes back to feeling like everything's super stable and we can predict and we know what it's going to look like and we know what the trends are going to be and all that stuff that we pull ourselves into. But right. we're going to behave more like it's like coronavirus and that's going to be our secret superpower. Right. Okay. So like as we talk about embracing uncertainty, I know one of the things you talk about sometimes is the power of, I'm not sure, right? Being able to admit that and thinking in probability. So how do I apply that here? And again, in all this uncertainty, how do I apply the, you know, when are we going to go back to work? When is the stock market going to do this? When's travel going to resume? When are we going to be able to hire people back? And on top of coronavirus, we have the very unfortunate situation with George Floyd and what happened in protests. And thank goodness, those protests, they're amazing. There's so much uncertainty and there's so much I'm not sure about things. How do I, how do I think about if I'm a startup, if I'm a human being, how do I prioritize and how do I think in terms of probabilities and set myself up for all this uncertainty? So, yeah. So one of the things that I think that poker really teaches you really well is that you don't know what the next card is. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at, at any given time, you know, there's sort of, if I have two cards in my hand and there's three cards on the board, there's 47 cards I don't know about. I right. haven't seen, I haven't actually seen with my own eyes. And any of those 47 could come on the next card. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean that I'm preparing for all 47 of those? No, because I can chunk them together, right? I can mm -hmm. be like, what if it's a club? Right. right. What if the card is below a five? Mm -hmm. uh, what if it's a face card? What, so I can get it into some chunks, you know? And so maybe I'm sort of thinking about five different groups of, of uh, groupings of cards that could come, but I've got to hold them all in my head at once. Right. Um, so I, it would be a huge mistake for me to think that my job was to know what the next card was going to be. Mm -hmm. That, and that's the mistake that we mostly make okay. is that we think we have to know it's going to be a V shaped recovery, or mm -hmm. we have to decide now, is it going to be a U shaped recovery? And mm -hmm. that's what poker, the, a really good poker player really gets this is that I'm not supposed, it would be bad for me to decide right. that I think it's going to be one thing. And instead I want to think about what are the different ways that the future might unfold? How are the decisions that I'm making right now best preparing me across those different futures? And then also thinking about what are the things that I would want to do mm -hmm. if, if those futures were to occur? Now, on right. top of that, I also have to think about as I'm trying to figure out what your hand is. And I've, again, I've got a bunch of different possibilities that I'm holding in my head at once. And mm -hmm. it's not like rounders where I say where Matt Damon comes in and says, you have a jack and a 10. It's right. thinking you might you have some chance of having this hand, some chance of having this hand, some chance of having this hand. And then what I do is I say, what would have to be true of Steve in terms of his actions that would make me be able to get more certainty around one or the other of these groupings. So I'm, I'm mm -hmm. thinking about if he raises, I'm going to think it's more likely he has this if he, right. you know, d right. So, so we can take that into understanding what, how we're supposed to deal with this, which is don't think that you can know how the future is going to unfold. Instead, try to think about what are the reasonable scenarios that could occur? And then what are the decisions that I can make? that best prepare me for sort of maximally across those scenarios. So you can look for a few things. Mm -hmm. You can look for uh, what decisions actually are pretty good for all of those scenarios. So there's gonna be some right. decisions that are kind of gonna work for all of them. Mm -hmm. You can think about given that I have some uncertainty about what those scenarios are, how can I prioritize decisions that are easier to reverse to give me some more flexibility? Because I know that right. the information landscape is really, really changing. Right. And I know there's a lot of luck, right? Like, so for example, when a vaccine comes is not in my control. So that's a matter of luck to me. Right. And I want to think about like, what are the decisions I could make where maybe I'm saying, I think there's a higher probability the vaccine won't come for 18 months, but uh, if something changes really quickly, like how can I reverse back and be prepared for that? So you right. can think about that. By the you way, can Amazon. Think about, 
I was going to say Amazon and Jeff Bezos talk a lot about that. Decisions that can be reversed and decisions that can't be reversed. They're very different. You think of them right. differently. Yeah. Right. So he calls them two way door decisions, one way door right. decisions. So this is thinking right. within those frameworks, which is really right. important when there's multiple futures that can occur. You should mm -hmm. be prioritizing decisions that are reversible when you know you're, you're the information landscape is shifting. Mm -hmm. Another thing you can do is think about what are the things that I can do at the same time? So one of the things that happens to us is that we say, I feel like I need to know, I need, I need to place my bets on one particular future, and then I'm going to make the decisions that work for that future. And I think there's, I think there's kind of two things that are fitting into that. One is a little bit of magical thinking, right? If I'm placing my bets on this future, but I also do things that would be good for a different way that things might unfold, that somehow I might make that thing happen, mm -hmm. which is, but that's just magical thinking. So we need to get right. over that. Um, right. And then the other thing that I think happens is that we're afraid of being wrong. And so uh, we're afraid of like, I really thought that, the, you know, I thought that this was the most likely way that things were going to unfold. But then I also did some things that were good in case it was, a, you know, I thought it was going to be a U-shaped recovery. I, that's how I behaved. But then I did some things that were good in case it was a V-shaped recovery. Or I thought that work from home, like 60% of the workforce was going to continue to work from home. But then I also made some decisions that were really good in case 20% of the workforce is what continues to work from home, that right. you're going to be wrong it, to place those bets if it doesn't turn out that way. But that's, of course, not wrong or right, because you weren't saying you were wrong or right in the first place. So one of the things that you can do, and I think the example that I gave in the Medium article was like- I was going to say that. So this is all from your, I know you had your Medium article recently, the three ways to prepare for a future you can't predict, right? Yeah. So yeah. so yeah. we can think about combining these ideas of um, uh, like flexibility, like what's the one-way versus the two-way door decision, and then also op exercising options in parallel in a very simple example. Um, if I'm trying to think about uh, which would I rather be doing right now, um, extending runway or maybe really go on a hiring spree and try mm -hmm. to acquire customers that other people are losing, right. um, I might prioritize extending runway because it's the more reversible decision. So if I, I can't unspend money, right? right? But if I've extended run, runway, I can I can then spend it when new information comes in. So maybe I prioritize that. But... I think about how can I prepare for two different scenarios unfolding, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, do some reduction in force, but I'm gonna keep my uh, the, I'm gonna keep my star salesperson on because right. just in case the the recovery is much faster than I'm predicting, then I've got the right personnel in place in order right. to actually be able to ramp up and start spending that money wisely. And you, you can think that in terms of even reduction in force, right? So laying off people is less reversible than furloughing people, which is less reversible mm -hmm. than reducing salaries. Right. right, right. Interesting. Interesting. So um, so I know a lot of that you talked about in your in your Medium article, which was great. So in the multiple scenarios, it's really interesting. I just wanted to bring up one thing um, just to push a little bit on something you said. It was interesting. You talked about like if I've got three cards and somebody else has these cards and I know what cards and the possibilities are. I think the thing that is just... Um, really stunning to a lot of people and has frozen them in their tracks and gives them so much indecision is things like a global pandemic while Bill Gates thought and knew it was gonna come and he said he didn't do enough about it. That's, you've never seen that card before. It's not a queen of clubs and it's not an ace of spades and it's not a two of diamonds. It's like, oh, by the way, and a pandemic. You're like, what the hell is that? <laughs> what do you mean a pandemic? What? Where's that card? I've never seen it before. I think that's what really, you know, that and then all of the, protests that are going on again for all the right reasons, just like, wow, just, and there's so much happening all at once that drives so much uncertainty and some of it in really good ways, but some of it in just frightening ways. Um, it's just yeah, so, difficult. So I think that's a really, I think that's a really great observation. And, and so let me, let me sort of tie it back to mm -hmm. what I said that remember I said, like, I'm not thinking about the specific card. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to put them into categories, right? So okay. can we predict a, a global pandemic, no, but we can think about economic dislocations, True. which a global pandemic causes, right? right. So, so as you're thinking about the different, the different possibilities for the future, 
um, even when you're not in, in the state that we're in now, one of the things that should be in your scenario planning is always like, what if there's an economic dislocation? We've sure. had enough of them. They come around, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason, right? Like right. there's dot com crash. There's, I don't right. think that there were, I mean, there were some people, obviously, if you look at the big short, yeah, but yeah. most people weren't thinking there's a really big problem with in the mortgage Mor market. Right, that's mortgage going backed to, securities, right. That's gonna right. uncover fundamental weaknesses in, in right. the market that's then gonna cause a huge economic dislocation that's gonna take forever to recover from. Right. 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 So, so what the specific causes of the economic dislocation are, hmm. But you can certainly think about what if there's a really big retraction in the economy? Mm -hmm. Right? What what are we what happens if unemployment goes really high? What if there's other types of dislocation, right? Because we can think about dislocation from automation. Right, like what? What if unemployment shoots for the roof for, for for a variety of reasons? You can think within that what the specific cards are, mm -hmm. but if right. you're thinking in the category, then you don't have to worry as much about getting the specifics. I right, see. I don't need to worry about which club hits. Right. I just need to know that that category of things is a possibility. Got it. I wonder if I'm just trying to think of an analogy. I'm a I'm a pilot, right? And I go to put the gear down, and I pull the lever, and the gear doesn't go down. Well, in some ways, it doesn't matter what oh, caused the gear not to go down. I just know the gear's not going down. I've got a situation right, exactly. to deal with. Doesn't doesn't matter what caused it, but anyway. Um, okay. Right. Let's, let's, and and yeah. by the way, and pilots have really big checklists for all those things, sure. right? So so right. pilots are really big on checklists because they know that in the moment you're going to be a pretty poor decision maker, which is right. this is a good lesson to take. Yeah. And so for those for those categories of things that can go wrong, they actually have checklists to help you sort of think through them sure. in, in the moment. Um, the, the other thing that can be really helpful in this type of thing when we're talking about kind of edge cases mm -hmm. is to realize that um, the more points of view that you can get, the more likely you're going to come across a Bill Gates that's yeah. saying, you know, a pandemic is a really big possibility. Or, by the way, uh, David Epstein, who wrote Rain, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a book that everybody should read. Actually, in 2000, I think it was 2007, was saying like one of the biggest threats is the interaction between, uh, you know, animals and humans with coronaviruses, right? Like he was wow. actually like mm -hmm. talking about this quite, quite, quite a bit ago, like th 13 years ago or something. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to collide more with people who are thinking in that way? And right. that has to do a lot with the way that we interact with people on on our team, the way that we're getting ourselves to be exposed to contrary contrarians and contrary point of views, just sort of like the breadth of the dispersion of opinion, the dispersion of perspectives that we're allowing ourselves to be exposed to can right. help us actually get a better sense of what the scenario, the scenarios are that could occur and then why they might happen. Right. Okay. Let me, let me, I want to go on. Um, and this is a basic thing. I, I put it in this order. I want to go to the next topic, right? You talk a lot about that every decision is a bet. Right. So we bet that at Wednesday last week at one o'clock, the weather would be OK. And we all wouldn't lose our yeah. Internet and power. Lost that bet. Um, and luckily, the consequences weren't too horrible. But so you talk a lot about every decision is a bet. And I think it's really investors in very important, excuse me, for investors and startups that are watching today. Think about that. And a lot of times they'll, they'll think about it. But so what do you mean by that? What do you mean by every decision? Every decision is a bet. Yeah, so. Basically, so I think that people think about betting as like I go into a casino and I put my money on red and then the roulette, you know, spins and, you know, that's a gamble. That's a little different than a bet. Right. Um, oh, interesting. So, I never thought of the difference. Yeah. Yeah. So so the way that I think about when you're gambling mm -hmm. is um, uh, and it, a, a, a gamble is a specific type of bet. It's mm -hmm. a bet where you're at negative expectation. So. Okay. So a gamble is I go in and I bet in a situation where in the long run, I should lose given enough iterations, right? Enough coin mm -hmm. flip, I, I will lose, but I'm kind of hoping to get lucky and win. That's the way that I think about gamble. Um, that's a type of bet. It's a losing bet. Right. I'm kind of hoping to be lucky in the short run. Right. Um, but when we think about betting in the broad sense, what we're really doing is saying, uh, we are, are figuring out, given the resources that we have, I have a variety of different options that I can invest those resources in. And each of those options has a set of possible futures associated with it mm -hmm. that will occur with some probability. And each of those possible futures has a payoff. Mm -hmm. So 
given any option under consideration, if I were omniscient, I would know here are all the ways that it could turn out. Here is the payoff for each of those ways it could turn out. Here's the probability. And I could calculate an expected value. In other words, what the, what the, um, uh, the ultimate return on my investment would be. Given, mm-hmm. given that I'm choosing that option, if I could iterate it enough times, right? right? And then what I do is I then compare my options and I try to figure out, given what my risk tolerance is, my exposure to the to the bad stuff, right? What mm-hmm. I don't want to I don't want to go broke, for example. Um, right. I don't want to die, right? But given right. whatever my risk tolerance is, how much I can tolerate the possibility of a bad outcome, I figure out what option, given my resources that I have to invest is going to fit within my risk tolerance and give me the highest expected value. In other words, the highest ROI. Mm -hmm. That's all that a bet is. It just means that there's uncertainty in that, that I I don't really know. um, I I don't really know how it's going to turn out, Mm -hmm. but this would be the best way for me to invest my money given that there's this uncertainty. So some, some bets are more certain than others. So if we have a coin that we've examined and we know that it's fair, mm-hmm. so I know that it's going to land heads exactly 50% of the time. Right. And you say to me, let's do a coin flipping contest. And every time that you call the, it right, I'm going to give you uh, $2. And every time that you call it wrong, you have to give me a dollar. Mm-hmm. Now, that bet is very well defined, right? I'm going to make right. 50 cents on every dollar that I bet. But right. it's not certain. I could lose four times in a row. That's what makes it a bet. Right. right now, now you then add a layer in where the probabilities aren't always so objective, very mm-hmm. often subjective. And the reason for that would be um, there's a coin, but you haven't examined it. Or mm-hmm. I, I have a box of coins and I could be picking any one of those coins. So now you don't know so much about it. So, So that's the problem that we're in always, like right Got now, it. right? So... Uh, are are people going to continue to work from home? Right. Well, you you have to make a bet on that, right? So you have right. to think, given what I know about the world, mm-hmm. what do I think the probability is that it's going to continue as a trend? What do I think the probability it isn't? You can get more granular and you could you could say zero to 20% of the population will work from home, 20 to 40, 40 to 60%, 60 to 80, 80 to 100. And you can assign a probability to each of those. Right. And then you can make decisions accordingly and you're just figuring out what, how am I going to invest the resources that I have to get the best result across all of those possibilities? And, you know, just as, as an investor, so we invest in so many startups and urban tech and all kinds of sectors. One of the things we always like to hear in something like that, you know, I think people are going to work from home, but they're not going to work from home, is we'll say to a founder, so I have a question about all that. What's your unique insight? Like, you know, everybody else zigs and then you zag. Like, yeah, I think everybody's going to work from home, but here's the second order effect of that. Or right. here's what I think is going to happen. It's really fascinating to us as investors where we're like, okay, that was not obvious. You know, you look at that not obvious to make a decision. But anyway, just from the work from home. Let me let me keep iterating. So when you think about every decision's a bet, I know that you've talked and worked with a lot of organizations. You've spoken in front of Google and all kinds of people and startups and big companies. What do you think this means if I'm a founder, right? So if I'm I'm doing a startup, how should I be thinking about that every decision I'm making is a bet? Start a company is a bet. Hire more people. Go out and raise another round. Think about maybe going public. Can you talk about like what you've seen with startups and founders maybe like and how they do this correctly or not correctly sure. around decision making? Yeah. Um, ugh, it's such a broad topic. So let me try to bring okay. it down into a specific sure. example. Yeah. Um, so I think that one of the things that if we go back to this idea of the paradox of experience, right? Like one of the problems that, that people tell me all the time as, as startup founders and also mm-hmm. from the venture side right, is the feedback loop is really long. So how does any of this help us? Right. right. We, we're, we're making a bet on a company or on a strategy and it might not be, it could be seven years before. Right. That's exactly before we what I was thinking. Seven out. years. Right. So. Um, so, you know, that feedback loop is too long. So there's no point in doing it, you know, and sometimes it will go as far as, so there's not really any point in thinking this way because the feedback loops are too long. Right. And what I always challenge people to think about is what's implicit in the decision that you're making, make it explicit, force Mm -hmm. yourself to actually try to assign a probability and a payoff to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then figure out, then it's naturally going to create tighter feedback loops for yourself. 
Right. So, so as an example, if if somebody if somebody says, uh, we really think that people are going to be uh, that you know it's sixty percent, not even that. We really think that work from home is going to be a huge trend. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there's now there's two things that you want to do. One is that's kind of mushy. I don't really right. know what that means. So quantify that for me, mm-hmm. right? If if you like, for example, if you say, um, if I do this thing where I'm going to acquire customers at a loss, I think it's going to be really great for our future ability to acquire customers. By how much? Quantify right. it, right? right? And show me that. Show me that. Make yourself actually go through the discipline of saying, if I say I have a feeling that it's going to make, it's going to really increase. Um, you know, our momentum, Mm -hmm. what does momentum mean? Say what that means and then actually forecast those things and quantify them. It creates a much better sort of uh, precision to your thought and it makes you understand the thing that you're actually saying and the thing that you're actually making a decision about. Because I think that we end up with a lot of hand waving when we're in this sort of mushy world. The other thing is make sure that you're getting other people's opinions on those things Mm -hmm. that you trust um, without telling them what you think first. So, so if you're saying, I, you know, I think work from home is a really big trend. What does that mean? Does it mean 60% of people are going to work from home? 40%? What does it mean? Go and survey people and just ask them that question, um, so that you can get that answer. Then the second piece is when you have a decision that has a very long lead, figure out the things that would be, that will happen very quickly Mm -hmm. that can allow you to close the feedback loop, uh, faster. So, um, as an example, you, you could think about this, like, let's say that you're, um, let's say that you're investing at series A mm-hmm. and you say to yourself, uh, obviously I'm investing for the big exit, right? Right. But yeah. what, ha- what has to happen along the way in order to get to the big exit? So. Uh, an example would be it's going to fund at Series B. That would just be an mm-hmm. example, right? Right. So what that means is that implicit your, in your decision to say that I think this company is investable at A mm-hmm. is you're saying that you, you're you making a prediction about what's going to happen at B. So right. just make it explicit. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, when, you're, when you're making a decision about uh, when to go out for funding, Think about it that way, right? What are the what are the things that need to be true of the world in order for that to be a good decision? Let right. me try to predict those things and see mm-hmm. how good I am at sort of closing those loops for myself. So, um, I mean, like it, it, it's like so so in poker, you could see how that would be the case. If I say to myself, I have these options that I'm going to bet or raise here. When I do that, implicit in that decision is that I think that you're going to react to that bet in a certain way. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really making a prediction. And the more that I can make that explicit, the better off I am. Because then when you do the thing back, I've got better feedback and I've got a closed loop that doesn't make me wait until the very end when I find out when I won or lost the hand or even if I won or lost during the session or won or lost during the year. Right. Okay, got it. Let me let me. I want to move a, a little bit. Uh, just a couple of quick comments and thoughts, just from the investor perspective and what you're saying. And by the way, I just want to say that I find a lot of entrepreneurs and startups are not great at figuring out that everything is a bet. These decisions are a bet. They don't understand what their highest risk bets are. You talked about it. We see startups all the time, and they're waving their hands. It's going to be huge. It's going to be well. That's a bet and a decision. Okay, but what does that mean? Right. right. And we also say you can't wave your hands, but you can yeah. point at data. Every customer is going to want it. Well, show me three. Well, I can't. Right. That's why I need a million dollars. No, you don't. You can de-risk that and right. make a better decision. The other thing I just want to say, though, is I find that a lot of people, and and I'll just kind of roll through this real quick, is they're not great at making decisions. And I just uh, let's just make this unbelievably simple. I don't know if you used to remember a long time ago, we used to ride in the back of things called Ubers and Lyft and taxis a long time ago. <laughs> and people get in the back of an Uber and they don't put their seatbelt on. Well, that's a decision that you've made. And by the way, is that a good decision? What are the consequences of that decision? For instance, if you do a face plant into the window, if the car gets into an accident. So that's, I just think, I I love your thinking. Every decision is a bet. And you just bet that the person that you don't know that's in the front seat that has a four and a half star rating, today is not the day they're gonna get T-boned in an accident. And you've decided to make that bet, which is interesting to me because the consequences are huge, the effort is small, and sometimes people are just lazy 
but that's the thing. The last thing I just want to mention in all of what you're talking about from a, a, an investor point of view, I look at like when a startup pitches us at DreamIt, a pitch deck is like a hand, a, a card of a hand of cards, right? There are all these cards. What's the problem I'm, I'm solving? What's the market size? What's my go-to-market strategy? What's the team? But I can't see all of the cards. It's just like when you talk about poker, we're just seeing like three or four of the cards and we don't know the other competitors, the other players at the table. We don't know what's gonna happen in the market. And an investor is making a bet and they're doing that on imperfect information. And I think a lot of startups don't realize that. They're like, well, just write me a check for $3 million. No, it's a bet and it's a bet based on imperfect information. You've got a few cards, you really have no idea what's going on. So it's kind of interesting. The last thing I just want to say is, I think you're right that an investor, it might be seven years for a payoff. And I guess I've never played tournament poker. You know, it, it, that's a long game. VC and startup investing is a long game, but there are data points along the way. You get data. You're playing You're playing hands, right? You're, you're a seed, a series A. Every meeting is like a hand where the startup hopefully gets feedback. We give our startups a lot of feedback. Um, and hopefully the investor gets feedback, but just a couple of things. If you don't mind, I'm gonna transition because I don't want to run out of time with you. Can I just yeah, yeah. for one yeah. second? Yeah. So I totally agree. And, and what I'm saying is that if you wait until after you've gotten the feedback and you go try mm -hmm. to remember what were the things that I was thinking at the time? How was I incorporated in this into the thinking? Doing that after the fact is incredibly hard. Right. Because we tell ourselves narratives that fit to the world, which is why I'm saying, think about what are the steps along the way to that seven year exit? What mm -hmm. are the things that I'm implicitly saying are gonna be true, that I'm predicting will happen? If I'm an angel, I'm right. saying that I think there's a high enough probability of it being funded at seed. Okay, great. Make that part of your process and actually explicitly state what your prediction is. Now, all of a sudden, you, you're made, and what, what this does is it allows you to capture all sorts of data about the no's. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you see 100 companies and only three of them are investable. Right. 97 of those companies, you actually said, this is what I think is going to happen. Right. You can now follow those and say, how good am I at knowing my own market? Right, right. And right? regression test and see how you You're did. getting yeah. feedback that might come within six months instead of seven right. years. You're getting feedback that might come within a year instead right. of instead of seven years. And it allows you to close those loops. And it solves the problem of the look back is really, really hard. Try to right. do as much looking forward so that when you get the information, you can go back and see what you thought at the time in a way that actually gives you reasonable feedback. Right. Right. Okay. And we're going to go to the next topic. We're going to talk next about biases in decision making. If we could talk about that for a bit. Before we do, I just wanted to reintroduce Annie Duke. Thank you for joining us today. If people have questions or comments, please put them in the comment section. Annie will stay with us for about 10 minutes at the end. We'll answer people's questions. We have a few questions already in there. Um, so, biases in decision making. So, could you define quickly maybe cognitive and inherent biases, right? And, and identifying them and dealing with them. Yeah, so basically cognitive biases are this. There are things that are objectively true of the world. Like if we were omniscient, we would know what they were. Mm -hmm. um, and there, then there are things that we think are true of the world. Um, and bias is what lives in between those two things. So, well, I mean, there's other things. Like just imperfect information lives in between. Right. The, there's just stuff that we don't know that doesn't allow us to do that. But sometimes we actually have the data that we need uh, in order to get us to something closer to what's objectively true of the world. But because of cognitive bias, because of the way that we process things, we actually don't see what what the truth is. Mm -hmm. So uh, so that can be in both in the way that we interpret information and also in terms of the information that we actually seek. I'll give you a couple quick examples. Yeah. Uh, confirmation bias, people know a lot about this one. When you have a very strong belief about something, um, you will uh, seek out information that confirms the thing that you already believe. So the classic is that uh, people on the left watch MSNBC and people on the right watch Fox News and they're not flipping back very right. much. Right, right, right. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're reading, uh, you know, more left leaning media or more right leaning yeah leaning media, because we really like to hear our beliefs echo back at us. Obviously, this creates this problem between the objective truth and what you believe to be true, because intermediating in between there is information. And we're not really taking a look at the stuff that we don't know in a random way. Right. Simple example. Uh, in terms of um, how do we interpret outcomes? Um, 
there's something called self-serving bias. And this was actually one of the problems with poker players. That's a problem with what well, you're going to hear this with your own entrepreneurs, yes. which is when things go poorly, it's because I had bad luck. Right. And when things go well, it's because I'm a freaking genius. Right. right. So, uh, and we all know that, right? Like I'm, I'm, my son would come home from school and if he got an A on a test, he studied really hard and I'm supposed to give him a reward. And if he got a C right. on the test, it was because the teacher put stuff on the test that he, they hadn't taught, and the test was actually just really hard. Right, which success would be out has of his control. Right, success has many fathers, failure is an orphan. Right, right. <laughs> same exactly. type of thing. So, yeah. so you notice what's happening there is that if the only way this is part of the paradox of experience, if the only way for us to learn is from experience, you can have you can you can have this experience, and the way that you interpret what that means about your own decision making is very different depending on whether the outcome was good or bad. And we'd like to actually treat those the same. That's for ourselves. We, For other people, we do different things. So mm -hmm. we can do something called resulting, which is if the outcome is bad, we assume that the quality of the decision was bad. If the outcome is good, we assume that the decision um, was brilliant. And that's like when startups succeed, the founders are always brilliant. When startups fail, they made all sorts of mistakes along the way and look at how horrible they are. Right. right. And, and obviously it's a mix. The successes have lots and lots of luck involved and the right. failures have lots and lots of great decisions in there. So if we're, it makes it very hard for us to learn from experience. So those are some examples of, of cognitive mm -hmm. bias. And what we want to do is set up systems around us and the way that we think about the world that's going to reduce the influence of bias. It's going to get us Clo as close as possible to what's objectively true of the world, knowing we're always going to be pretty far away from that because we live in a cloud of not knowing very much. But right. even inching toward what's objectively true of the world is going to is going to really pay off in terms of in terms of the quality of your decision making. Right. Can I? I just want to mention quickly, and then we'll move into the next topic. That it's interesting when you talk about biases that. We had Laura Wang. Laura is a professor now at HBS, Harvard Business School. She used to be at Wharton here in Philadelphia. She has a fascinating area that she studies, talking about investor biases in decision making. So we did a show with her how to leverage invest how to leverage investor biases when raising, like almost use it against an investor. And she always talks about like her thing is for all the talk about due diligence and digging into financials and de-risking investments. A lot of them, you say, well, at the end of the day, why did you make the decision to invest? Eh, gut feel. And it was best on a lot of biases. She, she talks a lot about that and even how to leverage it and understand how an investor is thinking and how to almost use their biases, understand them so you almost could use it against them. Not against them, but like leverage it. Yeah, so so I, I love that topic. It's something that yeah, I work with my clients smart. on. You know, for example, yeah. if you're doing an LP raise or, or something like that, like I'll, I'll talk to them about how to use, you know, how, how to make this turn into an advantage for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The way that you can think about some of these biases that you can also leverage these things for good as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, people think about tribalism, for example, is a is a really really bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. And when it runs on its own, obviously we can see this in the political environment right now. But you can right. turn that into good if, mm -hmm. for example, uh, on your team, like you you have a team that you're working with and you're really trying to get them to get comfortable with truth seeking and get out of that echo chamber. If you use a lot of tribal language and you you say, if we know what tribe come, what we get from tribe, which is distinctiveness from other people belonging to a group, and then and then that's all around our epistemology, the things that we believe to be true, you can really work with your team to say what makes us special is that unlike other people, we can admit we're wrong. Unlike right. other people, we're really interested in hearing other points of view. So mm -hmm. notice what you're doing is kind of like leveraging the fact that we all want to belong to a tribe. But determining what it is the belief system is that we're we're bringing that on. So none of these things have to be good or bad. Like you can you can turn them into something that really works for you mm -hmm. and helps you along in your decision making. Right. Interesting. Okay. I want to go um next topic, and you you touched on this briefly. I just want to go a little deeper. Learning from successes and mistakes. Um. And I I talk about that all the time. I'm. Lots of successes, lots of failures. And I always talk about, you know, in startup land, you, you you tend to fail a lot and you learn more from your failures. And the joke I always have is I'm, I'm very well educated at this point. I don't need any more education. But anyway, success is a mistake. So how do you separate? And you talked about this a little bit. I just want to go a little deeper. How do you separate outcomes 
from decision quality, right? That's like, and you talked about this, right? Confusing decisions with outcomes and, and that whole idea about resulting and not confusing luck with skill. Like, can you just unpack that, particularly towards startups? And again, like challenging times, a lot of uncertainty. Thoughts? Oh gosh, there's there's a variety of ways that you can do it. The, the first is I'll, I'll talk about a kind of inoculation, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I've been talking about things like think about what's implicit in the decision you're making, make it explicit and specifically forecast it Write down. I think that 60% of the population is going to work from home and then a quick rationale. And here's why mm -hmm. right. Perhaps reasons why, and just record those, like create a record of right. what the rationale was, what your thesis was, mm -hmm. what the specific forecasts were that informed that thesis, what the rationales for those forecasts were and create a record of it. Now, when you get an outcome, you're just more likely to get the right lessons out of it because you can kind of match it up and you can say, I'm not so worried whether whether I, I had a success or a failure. What I care about was, was there something unexpected in there? Because right. I want to be a really good predictor of the future because ultimately that's what a decision is, is I'm making a prediction of, of the future. That's what a bet is. I'm saying, I think if I choose this option, I've got the best possibility of the future unfolding in the way I like. So yeah. if I were to take a poker example, what I would say is, I know that there's a possibility that the queen of clubs might hit. So if mm -hmm. it does hit, I find that uninteresting because it was in the set of possibilities I have. What I find interesting is if I think there's no poss if I don't think in a million years that you're bluffing, mm -hmm. and then it turns out you were, now there's something for me to learn because that was really, really unexpected. Mm -hmm. Maybe I think there's no possibility that you have two aces. There's no way, and then you turn your hand over and you have two aces. Now that's something unexpected. It doesn't align with what I thought that went into the decision, and that's where I can learn. So what that's we're it. trying to do is untie ourselves from the quality of the outcome, is it good or bad? And start to tether ourselves to whether it was an ex expected or unexpected. So yeah. I'll give you an, an example that hopefully will resonate with you, like why this is so incredibly important. Let's say that you're uh, uh, making an investment and you have some prediction, like let's say that we're investing in a real estate project and we have a, a or let, let's say that we're making a prediction, we're gonna roll out a particular uh, uh, software feature and we think that uh, user uptake, we're gonna increase 10% uh, of our users are gonna uh, adopt it in the first week. Sure. Okay. And it turns out that it's just a dud. Right. Nobody, nobody wants to use it. We're having some huge meeting, mm -hmm. right? A debrief. And we might be saying like, oh, we're not worried that nobody adopted it. We really care about process here. And let's try to figure out where we went wrong in our prediction about whether users would really like this. Um, but you're having a very long meeting about it. But mm -hmm. let's say instead that you roll it out and 20% of your users like immediately adopt it in the first week. You're not having a really big meeting of like, why did we think it was only going to be 10%? You're just high-fiving and having champagne and talking about how amazing you are. Right. Right. right? So you're losing that ability to learn from the fact that actually you, you had double the adoption that you were expecting because mm -hmm. under investing is just as bad as over investing and we right. sort of lose half the opportunities to learn. If instead what you say is what we really care about is was this unexpected? Mm -hmm. Then you're gonna learn from both and you're gonna say like, what is there to learn that we thought that there was, you know, 10% of our users were gonna, was, were gonna adopt this and instead 20% did. Let's try to figure out, what, did we miss something? Was this just out at the tails? Is this something we could replicate? Mm. So on and so forth. So t tr you, first of all, write down why you think something is going to happen. Make specific forecasts about it. And then when we're, the world reveals itself in a way that's unexpected, mm -hmm. then you're naturally going to learn from both the successes and the failures because there's right. going to be unexpected stuff in both of those. Right. I just want to point out one thing and then we'll transition, I think, is that it's funny, as I'm sure you all know, in startup land, people are going to say, they say all the time, if you're going to fail, fail fast. Um, and it's interesting. I learned a, a good friend of mine, also a lot of Philly things today. Roy Rosen um, is down at Penn. He's the chief innovation officer at Penn Medicine now. Super guy. And he taught me years ago an expression. No, it's not about failing fast. It's about learning fast and learning quickly. So he's like, don't fail fast, learn fast. And it's all about an order of magnitude. 
right? If I'm working on a software feature like you talked about and I'm gonna roll something out and I spend $3 million in three years building a software feature and I roll it out and it falls flat on its face, that's failure. If I mocked it up and spent you know, two weeks with a dev team, rolled it out and it didn't work, that's called learning, not failing. And it's all, order of matter, it's all a matter of time and money and order of magnitude. I think it's like learning poker. Again, I'm not a good poker player, right? So, but it's like if I'm playing dollar hand poker, it's different than when I'm playing thousand dollar hand, right? I'm not, I'm not failing. I'm learning. It's just a, a less expensive way to learn. So I think it's, it's interesting in decision making and success. So, yeah. So I, actually, yeah. I love that. And one of the things that I try to teach people is decision stacking. So in yeah, a world yeah. really data rich, I think that mm -hmm. we can pull ourselves into thinking that with enough data and enough thinking the problem through, right. that we somehow come up with the, an exact answer of how the world's going to turn out, right? How is it going to mm -hmm. react to it? Right. Um, What's a lot better is just to poke a lot, right? Is to figure out, okay, I've got this really big decision that I want to make on the horizon. What are all the little decisions that I mm -hmm. can make along the way that are pretty low impact? They're not going to have a big effect on my bottom line, but they're mm -hmm. going to help me become an information gathering machine that's going to start to tell me the most important information, no matter what it is that I think that I know, the most important information is, does Steve like it? Right. So the more that I can poke at Steve, and say, hey, I'm gonna do these little things that are gonna to start to inform this much bigger thing that I can do, the better off you are. And so like do these kind of low, I'm not gonna think it through too hard, like I'm just gonna sort of put it out into the world and that's gonna mm -hmm. allow me to see. And, in, and you do this in poker as well, you make these tiny little bets that help me to build a model of you as a player. So oh, that when you have to make a really big decision, like I've decided that I'm gonna go all in, I've got a right. much better model of you as a player because I've poked around with these tiny little bets so much. So that's that learned fast that fits in that's with cool. that concept. That's cool. We've covered a lot, a lot of ground and I'm, I'm just trying to be careful of time. It's two minutes until two and I still want 10 minutes of questions with you. Okay. I wanted to hit the last topic with you. The last topic is you have a new book coming out, how to decide simple tools for making better choices. So in all of what we're talking about, I don't think the book comes out in September or so. September 15th, but you can pre-order it now. I already did. I already did. I've got it pre-ordered on Amazon. So can you talk talk to us a little bit? New book coming out in September. What are you going to cover in that book? What's what's new and different? And by the way, this is book number what for you? I mean, I know these are mainstream. You wrote poker books too. I think this is book number six. Six. Wow. Incredible. I think it's six. I think okay. it's um, so gosh, the journey of how how to decide actually. I think it's actually a really good uh, example of, uh, you know, commit, but hold your, hold your, uh, you know, hold your beliefs pretty loosely so that you'll change as you go along. I thought so you were going to say chips, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the, the way that, the way that I initially uh, conceived the book was I just went to Penguin and I said, hey, I, I wrote this, you know, how to decide. I mean, I wrote Thinking in Bets and the biggest thing that people come up to me and say is, okay, this is really interesting, but how? Right, right. Right, like, okay, embrace uncertainty. Like, you know, it's, yes, there's multiple futures that can occur. Uh, right. I should probably be thinking about that. But like, how would I actually do this? And, I, and mm. so I went to them and I said, I'd really like to write a book that teaches people how to do it. And it was literally going to be a thinking and bets workbook. That right. was it. It's going to be short. Oh, interesting. Right. It's going to be really right. short. Uh, you know, it's going to be like, you know, 20,000 words just exercises to go along with the book. But then, you know, I think that my editor had a really good insight, which was, um, hey, that's going to leave out all the people who haven't read the other book. And maybe you should uh, write a write a book that sort of speaks to a broader audience. So uh, what I kind of didn't realize at the time was that that meant that I had to thread a needle, right? I don't want to mm -hmm. bore people who have read Thinking in Bats, but uh, I also don't want to confuse people who haven't. And what ended up coming out of that, which I'm incredibly grateful for, is that this book is almost all new ground. So, oh, wow. So it opens up where Thinking and Bats starts, which right. is th this paradox of experience, which has to do with resulting and kind of how do you deal with that. And it's got it's uh, got lots of sort of new ideas and new ways to think about these problems, but also real thought experiments in there. Like, uh, I think one of the opening thought experiments for resulting is uh, you buy stock in an electric car company because you bought the car and you love it. Besides, right. it, the founder is a visionary tech billionaire. Right. The stock quadruples within a year. Was it a good decision or a bad decision? Then I redo the scenario and I say, you, you buy stock in an electric car company because you buy the car and you love it. And besides, right. it's a billionaire 
you know, tech visionary, right. the, fact that the company, the stock goes to zero in a year was a good decision or a bad decision. And I'm sure you can feel in your gut, even though you know that, of right. course, in the first case, it's a good decision. In the second case, it's a bad decision. And that's sort of the absurdity of the way that we do these things, because in either case, it's the exact same decision, right? So the decision right. quality is the same. In both cases, it's a terrible decision because like, you Got didn't it. actually do any investigation of the company. Right. But so it kind of walks through that. So it's got lots of thought experience. Then it has lots of tools. Like, how do you create these? Uh, how do you create these records of the knowledge that you have, these expectations? It goes into how do you actually think about scenario planning? It, it Lots of tools for you to be able to do that. How do you think about counterfactuals? Why are base rates really important? What's true of the world mm -hmm. in general? Um, uh, there's a whole chapter on thinking about the inside versus the outside view. What's the world from my perspective versus the right. world from Steve's perspective and Empathy. how to allow right. those things to collide? I've mm -hmm. got a whole chapter on going fast, which is what we just talked about how do you poke right. it more quickly, right? Mm -hmm. How do you actually speed your decision making up? Where I think that when people read Thinking in Bets, they think that I'm recommending that you slow it down. Right. Uh, my bad, I wasn't clear about that. So I wrote a whole chapter to clarify that and said, mostly you're supposed to go faster and here's how. Um, and then there's a like a whole chapter just on negative thinking, meaning not I think I'm gonna fail, but I'm gonna think about the ways that things go wrong and how do I actually instantiate that? Because if I can think more clearly about the way that things go wrong, it's going to drastically increase the chances that things will go right for me because right. the world will not surprise me in bad ways. And even if it does, I'll have a plan already in place for it. And then, um, and then the last chapter is all, how do I talk to other people to solve for this problem? The stuff that I know like fits on the head of a pin and mm -hmm. the stuff that I don't know is the size of the universe. And if I think about the two things that that befuddle my decision making, one is luck. I can't do anything about that. Right. But one is imperfect information. I actually can do a lot about that if I'm willing to take this walk through the universe of stuff that I don't know in a way that that's more random and, you know, so that I can collide with more information that uh, I haven't come across before, maybe that disagrees with things that I already believe in. Maybe I can behave toward that information in a more rational way. And throughout the book and culminating in the last chapter is really how do you talk to people to make right. sure that you're getting the most accurate view of what they believe as opposed to them telling you what you think that they think that you want to hear. And right. that's really, how do you do that, particularly in a team setting, is actually quite difficult to do. And it's it, the whole thing is filled with tools about how to solve for that problem. So, um, you know, it's really like, how do you deal with uncertainty? And then how do you really get a focus on this knowledge problem? Right. right. So that the beliefs informing our decisions get, get to be higher quality. So cool. I'm actually really, really excited about it because it explores so much new ground. Oh, and it's also super practical. Right, and it comes out in September, right? In September, yeah. Okay, and just a quick note, and then we're going to uh, go into questions, is when I first saw the cover, I was like, wait, did Annie go off the reservation a little bit? I wasn't sure if it was an ACT, SAT prep book, right? Like, how to decide, like, which answer? <laughs> I'm taking my, you know, ACT, and I need to get into college, although all the college are going test optional because of what's going on in the world. But anyway, no, I'm looking forward. Again, I already have a pre-order on Amazon, and I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Do you mind, can we keep you? We have a whole bunch of questions sure, from yeah, people absolutely. and watching and listening. We covered a lot of ground. Thank you. Let's let's jump into questions, and I'm going to pull up the first question, and, and Dustin will bring it in, I'm sure. The first question I have is, oh, here's one. We talked a bunch about investors said, you know, how can I get early customers to make a bet on me, right? So, uh, you know, we talked a lot about investors, but let's say I'm an early startup and they're basically, I'm asking a customer to make a bet. Any, any thoughts on how I can make a customer more confident when I'm an early stage startup? Uh it depends a little bit on what kind of customer. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of give you two different um, ways. Uh, one is is to create tribe, to create a sense mm -hmm. of belongingness. Right. Um, so the more that you can use language about identity, the better off you are. Obviously, that's kind of the brilliance of Instagram, right? right? That right. is that it ends up you 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 the brand and your identity become aligned, and so mm -hmm. it, it's a statement about your identity. But if you're if it's more of an enterprise or you know, B2B, um, one of the things that I really like to think about a lot is um, something called the endowment effect. Mm -hmm. So just to really quickly what it is, um, I have 
a bunch of people price, just, you know, write down the price of what they think a visor and a mug is worth. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you pay for that? Um, and it's a variety of items. Wait, a, a, a Yeti mug that says dream it on it or a regular? No, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm, <laughs> actually, that would be right. But, but anyway, I just have a lot of items and I have people come in and rate them. This is a lot of work done by uh, Dick Thaler, Richard Thaler, who's a Nobel laureate. And um, I find out that people think that both uh, advisors and mugs, they'd pay the exact same amount for Let's say it's $3. Mm -hmm. Now, Steve walks in the room and Dustin walks in the room. And when you walk in the room, I say, Steve, hey, I'm give for participating, I'm giving you this mug. So now the mug is yours. And Dustin comes in and I say, for participating, I'm giving you this visor. Right. Now, I ask you two questions what would you sell your mug to Dustin for? Mm -hmm. And what would you buy Dustin's visor for? And I asked the same, the opposite question of, of um, Dustin. Now we know from a bunch of people that people think these things are both worth $3. And right. what ends up happening is you're like, yeah, I, like I'd pay $3 for that visor, but this mug, I would only sell for six. Wow. So, wow. so what they talk about is that the mug has become endowed to you, right? Mm -hmm. And and our, de our ideas become endowed to us. They, they become part of our identity. And we think that our ideas are, are more valuable than other people's ideas. This is a lot of what creates this problem with like confirmation bias and right. a lot of the ways that we interact with the world. But to the point of what you said before, you can use that for good, which mm -hmm. is one of the best things you can do in order to create confidence in someone you're trying to develop as a customer is get them to be endowed to you. How do you do that? Ask some advice. If you really want to know, you call up the person, you say, I'm really struggling with, I'm, a, I'm an early stage startup and I, I'm trying to figure out how can I get my customers to make a bet on me and take a leap of right. faith with me. Think about someone who's a really important customer who mm -hmm. would really actually send a really good signal to the market right. and call them up and say, I, you know, you're so experienced and you obviously deal with a lot of, could you help me with this? You're not saying, will you be my mentor? That's a terrible thing to ever say to anybody. But right. you're saying, I just need your help because you're a smart person. Right. And I, I don't know what to do because obviously I'm not proven and I'm asking people to make a pretty big, what is your advice? Right. Okay. You have just now that. really drastically increase the probability that person will now become your customer because they are now endowed to you. Got it. So if this you, is one yeah. of those ways that you can turn that if you, if you haven't heard this one, sorry to interrupt, if you haven't heard this one, by the way, you'd love to, add, I think, to add it to your repertoire. One of the jokes we always has was when startups are raising funds and they're out pitching, we always say, if you ask for cash, you tend to get advice. And if you ask for advice, you tend to you get tend cash. To get so ask go. for a lot of advice, right? It's that yeah, same exactly. account kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's move to our next question. Next question comes and it says, so this is all about thinking and bets, right? How to apply this thinking to the HR hiring process? You're like, you're making a bet. Do you think about, are there, are you know, decision-making bets? Like, do you have any thoughts or experience with that, applying it in HR and decision-making? HR is a really amazing place to apply this to. So I'll use some of the concepts from my new book. Sure. Oh, great. So, so when you have someone coming in uh, who you're going to hire, you could do this from the beginning of the process, but let's say that we're already at interview, right? And let's say you're going to have four different people interview the person. Mm -hmm. Don't allow them to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. until they've actually uh, written down their opinions about the person. What opinion should be you be soliciting from them? Well, you can think about it this way. You can say, if someone came to me for advice and they wanted to know whether someone was a good hire into, into a position, what are, what are the things that would be important for, for me to think about? So you could think about like, uh, on a scale of zero to five, how good of a cultural fit do I think the person is going to be? You can have just things like just ticking off yes or no, they have the right experience. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if I, ha if let's say retention is an issue for you, uh, what is the probability I think this person will still be with the company in a year or 18 months or, or three years, right? And so you figure out what those things are that you would want to be helping somebody with if it were a, a candidate. You get that into a form, and then every person before they speak to each other who has mm -hmm. interviewed the candidate now fills that form out. So someone says, on a scale to zero five, I think this person is a four in cultural fit, and then they get to just write down a rationale, like a one sentence, and here's why I think that. Now, you bring that all together into one location, maybe you use Airtable or whatever, right? right. right? You bring all, everybody's ratings into one location, anonymized, and you allow everybody to now read everybody else's opinions. Only then do you discuss it as a group. 
now what have you done? You've reminded everybody that it's a bet because now what you've done is you don't know you're disagreeing with me if you think that person's a two out of five, mm-hmm. a cultural fit. Because mm-hmm. if you say you're you're like the big wig and you say, well, I mean, that person is obviously a terrible cultural fit. If I think they're a four, I'm unlikely to say so. Right. So now what's happened is you've allowed all of the dispersion of opinion to breathe and you've actually made some forecasts. What are we implicitly saying when we hire this person, what are the things that we're predicting will be true of this person mm-hmm. that will uh, that makes us think that they're a good hire? You've gotten the breadth of opinion. You've allowed them to breathe anonymously, but prior to talking about them actually within the meeting, and that will really increase the quality of the hiring. Huh? Interesting. Interesting. Okay, let me let me move to the next question because there's a bunch. There's about eight more to go, so I'll pound through them. So next question was when pitching an investor, how should I state what the bet is, or should I state it? Like, and just, I want to go back because listening to that question, it reminds me. Long time ago, I don't know if you know Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital, also here in Philadelphia. Josh, years ago, I was sitting in a lot of pitches with him. Sometimes at the end of it, an entrepreneur, you know, go for a half hour, an hour, and at the end, he'd say, look, at the end of the day, what's the bet? Usually there's like one key fundamental assumption. So um, anyway, do you, thoughts like, so again, when I'm pitching an investor, how should I state or should I state what the bet is? So in general, yes. Okay. In because I, I think that it is important to explicitly state what, what the bet is that you're making. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important to say here's what we think has to be is is going to be true of the world and has to right. be true of the world to make this bet good, to make it worthwhile. Mm-hmm. Um, those are signposts and that's important. And you can say, uh, assuming those signposts occur, here's 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 what we're thinking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's actually not even bad to say, here are, the, here are a few reasons why, why uh, if in two years it turned out it wasn't a good bet, here's why. Right. That's not, not a bad thing to do either because all of these show the person, show them that you're being very, very, very thoughtful. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking of. This so so right. expla- state it explicitly, say what you believe will be true of the world or is true of the world that makes this a good bet, mm-hmm. say what those are. And then do the exercise. It's two years from now, and it turns out it was a horrible bet. Here are the main reasons I we think that would be true. And if you can, you can also say, and here's how we we would deal with those things, mm-hmm. so that we mm-hmm. wouldn't actually, so that we wouldn't actually fail. So Got all of those things. Rep- that being said, there are occasionally investors who just want you to tell them that you know it's going to be great, and you, so know know the person that you're pitching to. I just okay. want to know your that. audience. Know okay. your audience, because there, there's right. some people who, if you say to them, and we've also thought about if in two years it turned out that this bet wasn't so great, here's why, they'd be like, right. you know, well, I read Napoleon Hill all day. I, I'm just into the power of positive thinking. Like, oh, right, 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 right. So know, know, your, know your audience. But, right. okay. but yes, the cool. most thoughtful people will appreciate it. Okay, cool. Um, let's go in. Now, the next set of questions came in for, via email and LinkedIn. When you were going to be on last week, somebody, one of the people who's watched Dream It Live a bunch of the past, Victor Espinoza, sent a bunch of questions, and I think he knows a bit about poker and startups, so he has very pokerish startup questions. Somebody, the next one coming up, it says, and I think it's up on the screen, thank you, Dustin, in the, in the lower third, which poker strategies can a startup apply during a negotiation with a big corporation? I'm just thinking. Oh, Bluffing yeah. And- oh, so many. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, first of all. I hope Victor's watching today. Yeah. First of all, make some pre-commitments. Okay. So what does that the, mean? Right. So one of the things that you learn in poker is that uh, things that in advance you would say you would never do or compromise on, you will compromise in the moment. It's like that um, the auction problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when you're in a negotiation, it's essentially an auction. So uh, so as much as you can in advance, really define for yourself what are the things we're willing to give on, what you know, how high or low are we willing to go, what are our must-haves, what are and really set that in advance and with your team really say like that you're going to stick to it. So you have to go in understanding like if it's not within the category of things that you're willing to accept, you, you have to be willing to break the deal. And uh, it may turn out that you sort of going into the next deal, you may sort of change your mind. But by the way, don't worry. That's also a good signal for the market that you that, that you can't be pushed around like that. That's right. okay. 
But that's one of the biggest problems is you, you'll go into a, a poker game and you'll say the, the maximum I'm willing to lose in this game is five hundred dollars, and then you lose the five hundred dollars and you're you're at the ATM being like, well, actually, <laughs> actually, um, and that's one of the biggest problems. So so really set what 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 your goals are and what you're willing to accept and not accept in terms of terms. The, the second thing that this is a little bit obscure, but the second thing that I think is really underutilized in negotiation, and this is something in poker that you do, is um, you can actually um, you can actually get people to cooperate with you more than you think you can. So people think about a negotiation as uh, two people deciding against each other, but it's actually a form of group decision making. Mm -hmm. So once you sort of understand that, you can kind of think about okay, how can I actually create, get them to get to the place that I need them to get? So in poker, a lot of times, like you'll allow the person to bet for you. Um, so you can do it. So here's- Wait, what, here, what, hold on, what does that mean? How do in poker do I let somebody else bet for me? Well, I want to bet, Yeah. but I know that if I bet, I'm not going to get the result that I want. So I'll check to get the person to bet my hand for me. Got right, so I'm getting the same amount of money in, but I'm getting you to do it for me. Okay, so okay. how might that translate? Um, I think that one of the big mistakes, and this also has to do with this idea of like, even when you're, because it is group decision making, even though you're you're obviously trying to negotiate against the person that still feels good to belong, mm -hmm. let's say that you go in and there's a particular term that you've really decided like, uh, you know, I'm not going to do this deal. I'm not giving up more than... Uh, 3% of my company, I wonder. Well, let's mm -hmm. say I'm not giving up more than 8% of my company. Sure. And they come in and they and they say, uh, we're going to offer you at this price for 5%. Right. So obviously, you're like thrilled, right? And so what most people do will go, great, let's go on to the next term. Right. But that's actually a really mo good moment to say, well, hold on a second. And right. then you say, we were actually thinking 3%. Right. And then you let them get back to the 5% that they were originally thinking, but now they're more likely to cooperate with you later mm -hmm. because you cooperated with them. And you have to remember that they don't have access to what your worst case that you would accept was, right? right. So what we right. tend to do is go, oh, that was great. I was willing to give up 8%. They're offering me 5%, so let's just be done with it, right? right. And we'll move on to something that I really care about. But if you if you actually allow them those wins in advance of getting to the things you really care about. So when you're misaligned in a way that works in your direction, it's still good mm -hmm. to negotiate that and negotiate them to the place that they were originally and kind of give up on that give up on that point, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does. Uh, by the way, you must spend a lot of time reading and thinking a lot about it, behavioral economics and things like Dan Ariely, because anchoring and all the way you're saying, it's like it all ties in. Cognitive psychology, poker, anchoring. It's very cool. Okay, we're gonna go to the next question from Victor. He was uh, he got in three great questions. And he put them in early, so we put them all in. Okay, so um, in poker, players must be patient enough to wait for a good hand to go all in. How is patience translated in the context of a resource constrained startup? Sorry, the words are so small in there. It's a long question. But again, like when you decide, I'm gonna, and maybe it's just a movie thing. You could tell us what happens in real po uh, tournament poker. But like, okay, I'm going all in, and I'm a startup, and I've got. When do I decide? Like, I'm going all in. Or is there a parallel? I, okay, I have to think about this one. That's fine. That's well, fine. First of all, there's two different ways that you can go all in. When is it yeah, you can yeah. call all in? Yeah. Uh, so if you call all in, you have to have a good hand. Okay. If you bet all in, you don't. Okay. <laughs> it might be bluffing. Right. Um. Interesting. Yeah. So. So. Basically, so so when would you go all in when you're bluffing? When you think there's a high high enough probability that you're going to win the hand mm -hmm. by doing so, right? Um, and so I think it kind of goes back to what I was saying before: is a few things is uh, when you're resource constrained, so that you know that you're going to have some really big bets that are going to come up. Mm -hmm. Really think about this decision stacking. Okay. What are, what are the decisions that I could be making in front of the thing where I have to go all in? All in is irreversible. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If I lose, I'm out of the game. But right. if I make a small bet, I'm not out of the game. That's a reversible decision, right? I get to still right. play. That's good. So, so this is where those frameworks actually really come into place. When you're resource constrained, it actually becomes even more important, right? Is how can I think about this decision stacking? So decision stacking is going to be basically uh, three things. Uh, thing number one is how can I uh, 
think about reversibility, right? Like I want to, if, if I don't like this option, how easy is it? What's the cost for me to get back to a, another option, including ones that I may have rejected in the past? And that's going to allow me to be more agile and make smaller bets so that when I do have to make the bigger bet, I've gotten a lot more information out of the world. Number two is think about what are the decisions that I can make right now that are low impact. In other words, if they don't go well, I don't really care, reversibility right. or not, that are going right. to allow me to give some inform get a lot of information that will help me to build a model of the world so that I know when I do actually have to make a bigger bet with my constrained resources that it's going to be better informed. Like a, an example of a really small decision would be like if I order the chicken or the fish in the restaurant, like in a year, mm -hmm. it's going to have affected my happiness if my chicken was a little bit dry. So right. uh, in poker, if I just make a little tiny continuation bet, it's not really a big deal because if I lose, it doesn't really affect my overall stack size. But I find out a lot about you. Mm -hmm. I see how you reacted to that that bet. So that's kind of the second thing. And then the third thing is as much as possible when you're resource constrained, try to think about how you can leave your options open, like optionality. It, not just in terms of reversibility, but are there, can I be making a bunch of bets at once? In other words, are there hedges available to me? So if I'm thinking about a particular strategy or tactic that I want to execute on, are there ways to meet me in smaller ways to be executing on other strategies or tactics that will allow me to see if I need to pivot before I really make the big bet down the road here? So you can have a strong opinion that strategy A is a really good one, but also understand that strategy B or C might also be options. And if you can make small bets, which would really be hedges um, on those strategies as well, um, then you're sort of gathering information at the same time. So an example of that would be an A-B test. Okay. Right? Right. You're releasing software and you're not sure, like build some crappy, you know, low cost version of the software and release it to 10% of your, one to 10% of your users, the other to the, a different 10% of your users and just kind of see what comes back at you because it's right. some you are going to have to really decide. So it's really about understanding that at some point we all have to go all in. It's true. Right. Uh, and when you're resource constrained, that might come up on you a little bit faster. So really think about this decision stacking. How can I do these small Right. things to, to get it really gather information from the world so that my model of the world is going to be much more accurate when I actually have to make that big bet. Right. One of the things, by the way, dream that we talk about all the time is what do you think are your one or two biggest assumptions and how do you de-risk those assumptions as quickly and cheaply as possible? So you make the smartest decision. A lot of times we see founders like, what do you mean? It's like, well, if I'm hanging, if I'm belaying, if I'm on a rope on the end of a cliff and I'm a hundred feet down from the edge of the cliff, what's the bet? Like, what's my biggest assumption? My biggest assumption is the rope, the rope is tied on and the rope's not going to break. It doesn't matter how nice my hat and my carabiner and my helmet, the bet is the rope's not going to break. So how do you then de-risk? If that's your most critical assumption, how do you de-risk those most critical assumptions so you make more intelligent decisions? Right. Like, is there a way for you to have a second rope? Right. One right. fails, that's right? It. Like, it's, yeah. it's the idea of like a second parachute, right? Like, I've got a, right. I've got a spare, so yeah. if my doesn't open, I've got another one. Um, I want to have an outdoor wedding. I rent it, I pay a rental fee for a tent that I may right. never ever use. But in case right. that particular future happens to unfold, you know, I'm ready. And, and and the reason why you need to do these little bets is to realize that, you know, there's something interesting about this question, which is uh, you have to be patient enough to wait for a good hand. But mm -hmm. I think what people need to realize is a good hand is relative to what I think the other player has. So it requires right. that I have a very good model of the other player. Mm -hmm. to understand when I'm willing to bet that my hand is better than theirs. It's very rare that you have what are called the nuts, which is a sure thing. Right, right, right. Mostly it's, I have built a model of you as a player that causes me to think that given what you've done in this hand and what I've seen from you in the past, that my hand will beat you. So mm -hmm. I am willing to call, willing to use my limited resources because I'm going to put all my chips in the pot. Um, okay in this particular situation. And I only get there by decision stacking, by doing all these little tiny small things in order to get a better model of you. Got it. Okay, let's, we'll do, there's a whole bunch of like four more and pure people still watching. We're gonna grab all these questions. Next question, very pokerish startup kind of question. How can a founder, you're gonna love this. Uh, I'm glad I don't have to answer this because I'm not smart enough in poker, right? No. How can a founder, no, no, you'll be fine. How can a founder stimulate a continuation bet from investors struggling with contingencies such as COVID-19? 
So maybe you could define for those of us that don't know, <clears throat> that would be me. What is a continuation bet first? Yeah. That's yeah. That that's all right. So Victor Victor did his homework bet. before he wrote these questions. That's that's the end of the Victor questions. Then it's other questions. Yeah. So a continuation bet is actually an example of of one of these small things that I do to build a model of you. All right. So um, I'm not just doing it to to build a model of you. I'm also doing it because there's value in it in and of itself. So it, it's serving a dual purpose, which we really yeah. like. But let's say that I raise uh, before the community cards come because I look like my hand or whatever, right. and and you call me. Mm -hmm. And now three cards come down in the middle, kind of no matter what those three cards are, I'm probably going to make a small bet at you. Mm -hmm. So that's a continuation bet. What I'm saying is I, I already started in this hand. I took an aggressive stance. I have what's called right. the lead. I'm the leader right. in the hand. Um, right. So I'm going to now use that in order to, to put a little decision to you. Right. And now I can see how you react to that, right? Right. And, and the thing is, from your perspective, because I'm kind of doing that all the time, uh, I'm not betting only, I'm not making that bet only when I have a good hand. I may have a good hand, I may not. So that kind of makes it a hard thing for you to react to. So that's right. a continuation bet. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, so how can you, even in COVID-19, how can, can you- I, can, I, can I add a little color to it maybe sure. also, right? So to me as an investor, I think, well, let's say we have a half a million or a million dollars in a company, the company maybe is, or everyone's trying to struggle with contingencies around COVID-19. I don't want to put good money after bad, right? A continuation bet. Well, I have money in. Well, am I just, right. you know, delaying the future? I don't know. That's kind of what was crossing. Yeah, that's called the sunk cost fallacy. Yes. Okay. I was just going to say, use that to your advantage. Okay. So, wait, who, who am I? Am I the investor or the startup? If you're the startup, use the sunk cost fallacy to your advantage. Got it. And how do you, what is that? How do I, if I'm a startup, what, I'm what do I say to I'm trying to protect your investment. Got it. Those words. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying gonna, to help we'll we'll do a them. we'll do a clip afterwards and put that on, on uh, on social media. That's good. I'm trying to protect your investment because exactly. I care. You know. By the way, I, th I don't know if we're the same age, right? It was Saturday Night Live a million years ago. Yeah. I'm Al Franken, and now that I'm too old to be drafted, it's why you should enlist and fight for me, Al right. Franken. <laughs> I'm trying to defend you. Right. <laughs> anyway, right. trying to protect your investment. I'm trying to That's protect your investment. Very sunk cost. That's what I would <laughs> partially say that. That's very good. Um. You know, I, I think that there's a few things you can do. I mean, definitely ask for advice. I mean, I'm just going to keep going back to that well because it's yeah. a really strong well. Hey, it's COVID and we're it's obviously this really uncertain environment and we're trying to figure out like with follow on investments, um, you know, how best to how, how, how best to, to talk to investors and like, you know, what what's going to make them understand that we're still we're still investable to help us get through this. Can you help us with that? Right. Um, so again, that's kind of using that endowment effect. I think, I think the other thing that can be really helpful right now is that uh, one of the things that people are kind of afraid of is investing when there's a lot of uncertainty. The good news is, is that if you're an early stage startup, you're sort of de, de, you're sort of de-risking on that side because again, it takes a really long time for, for these results right. to play out. So you're not, it's not like you're saying we're worried about an exit that's going to happen in August when who knows whether anybody's going to be buying anything. So mm -hmm. one of the things that can happen, for example, when you're pre-revenue, as an example, is that you can sit and wait. And right. you can say, hey, we got a lot of runway. We've reduced our run rate. Like, you know, we're coding. Mm -hmm. Maybe, assuming it's like SaaS or something like that, yeah. right? But but, you know, um, and we're obviously keeping that on, but we're really, we're, we're just going to wait until the uncertainty resolves. And that's an advantage that you have with us mm -hmm. is that we don't actually have to make any big decisions right. dur during the uncertainty. We have the luxury of waiting until we have much more information. People who are literally operating businesses right now are having to make really, really important decisions with very, very little information. Now, going back to what I said before, once COVID resolves and we have a a little bit more information we're not going to be all the way to like where we thought you know where everybody believes we were it's so stable and i know exactly what the future is but that little bit that you're moving in terms of the resolution of of the uncertainty as it relates to imperfect information is actually going to be incredibly helpful you're going to have a much better sense of um things like for example work from home is that going to continue I, you know we'll find out so i think that that's actually a really big selling point right now is that we have the luxury of allowing the information to reveal itself. So that we, we should be super attractive to you. Right, right. 
Okay, cool. Let me keep going. Um, next question is from Faramund, if I pronounce that correctly, Faramund. Uh, they ask, while we're assessing while we're assessing risk in hedging our bets in poker or investment, what are the ratio of importance between the imperfect data versus human and an environmental factors? I guess. Gosh, I want a clarification. Like it's human and environmental factors like luck, right? So is that okay, just stuff yeah. that you can't control? So I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what they mean. So I guess that I'll just pretend that I know what it means. Okay, well, I, or I was kind of thinking, is, is the, are they trying to get at like imperfect data versus the psychological, the human element to it? It's almost like in biases and decision making. It's where people are like, I see the data, but I make a decision from my gut. That's kind of what I read, but I may have oh, read it. Oh, oh, gotcha. Okay, totally. That's kind of what I was thinking. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Um, okay, so uh, what I would say is this, that data does not exist in a vac vacuum and data is not truth. Right. So you should think about all data is as imperfect because of human environmental factors. Mm -hmm. So these things actually mm -hmm. kind of go together. So this right. is what we can think about. I can give two different people the exact same data set. Mm -hmm. This is the first problem. And they can come to very different conclusions. They can model it very differently. The algorithm that they use, to, that they're inputting that data into can be incredibly different. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's number one. So let's let recognize that they're like imperfect data. Yes, data can be missing, but there's always data missing because someone had to collect it. Right. There were ways that that, that the way that you ask a question as you're collecting right. the data really, really matters. How so it got coded, one of the yeah. things that, that you should do is actually approach any data as if it's imperfect and try to figure out why. In other words, say to yourself, if it turned out that there was really something missing from this data or that the frame, like we were looking at it through the wrong frame or the way it was collected was through a weird frame that ended up spoiling the data or biasing the data, why do we think that that might be? So um, this just kind of goes into this pre-mortem, you know, as, as you're looking at, the, at data to say, it, you know, if, if we were to think that the data means this. Mm -hmm. And in six months or a year, or you figure out what the timeline is for that to be able to reveal itself, it turned out that that data didn't re didn't really mean that at all. Like we sort of right. figured that out. Why do we think that is? Like, and have everybody answer it separately. Remember, just like in the hiring example. Yeah. yeah. Everybody give your top three reasons why mm -hmm. you think that this data didn't actually mean the thing that we thought it meant. Right. Now you can start to poke holes in that, so you can treat it always as if they're human and environment you know, factors that just have to do with the way that humans process things, the environment and so on and so forth that are going into that. The other thing that's really good about that exercise is that uh, data today might be very different as, as the, you know, because the market can change, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you were to collect that exact same data set, well, as an example, you wouldn't want to use data from 2007 to make decisions about something in 2009, because there was a really big shift in the world that right, happened right. In, in that period. So when you're getting out in front of it and you're saying, we have this data set, we think it's telling us this. If it's two years from now and the world has revealed itself to us that it, it really that, was, that wasn't what the data was telling us at all, right? Or that we what we should have taken from the data. Some of those things are going to be big paradigm shifts or big market changes are going to be in the way. And some of it's going to have, have to do with like, well, let's actually poke around at this data and figure out what's missing. And all of that is going to get you to look at it more skeptically and to stop fooling yourself into thinking there's something called perfect data. Right. right. So that was a weird question okay. to answer okay. to that question, but I hopefully... We have three more questions. Are you okay if we go five yeah. more minutes? Okay, I just want to be careful on time for you. Um, next question is from Sean Buchanan. Sean asks, in judging decisions to outcomes, is there a framework or model that you suggest in calculating that? In judging decisions to outcomes, meaning- I think that's related almost like resulting kind of thing is what yeah. I, I think. Yeah. Is there so, a framework or model that you see? It sounds like there's a book in September, but anyway. There, there is. <laughs> uh, and I'll just give you two things from the book. Again, do as yeah. much work as possible. You mean recorded in advance? Like what's your thesis, yeah. that type of thing? Okay. Yeah. Um, because that's really actually the only way to sort of, it, it's, it's really the best way to sort of get yourself out of like, how did it actually turn out? Um, mm -hmm. The other thing that you can do, uh, I'll give three. The other thing you can do is uh, when you're seeking advice from somebody to uh, leave your own opinion and the outcome out in trying to find out what they think about the quality of the decision process. So uh, like it, I'll give you an example from poker. If I'm asking you about a hand, 
I would say, I would tell you what my cards were. So I would say like Steve raised in front of me, I would say some things about you. Like um, he was pretty active at the table. He was entering like 30%, 35% of the hands that he was dealt. He was pretty aggressive. Um, when he entered a pot, he tended to raise. What I would not say is what I thought your hand was because that's part of what I'm trying to elicit from the other person. So I would just, I would describe you as, I would give some data on you as a player that, and then I would say what your actions were. And then I would say, and then I look down at ace queen. Mm -hmm. Now I'm telling you a hand from the past, right? So I know what I, I know what I did, but mm -hmm. I stop there and I say, what All do you right. think I should have done? This is what we don't do. We always say like, Hey, here's this political article that I read and here's why I think it's really biased and the author's really messed up and I can't even believe they said that. Will you read it and tell me what you think? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a way to not get good information from someone. Right, 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 right. Use other people, like get other people's point of view, but you have to communicate to them in a particular way that allows their point of view to breathe. So I give you the facts and I leave my opinion out of it, part of which is what I thought the right thing to do was, and then I just ask you what I should have done. And I do that, I iterate that all the way to the end of the hand without telling you whether I won or lost. Right. So now that allows you to tell me to get to that decision quality without sitting under the shadow of the outcome itself. The last thing that you can do, because it's all about knowledge, is say to yourself, what did I know at the time? What revealed itself after the fact? Mm -hmm. When I look at what revealed itself after the fact, was any of that knowable beforehand? Right. Now, the outcome itself wasn't knowable. Once you say it, mostly the answer is going to be no. Sometimes mm -hmm. the answer is going to be yes. And then you can just follow it with, yes, it was knowable, but could I afford it? So to your could point. I, could right, I afford what? I to afford know it? it? To know it. So, it. Yeah. so okay. you can think about it this way, right? Like um, uh, if I'm thinking about taking a job in a new place and I don't know if I'm going to like the new city, I could find out if I like living there. But that would mean that I would have to go move there and actually live there. And by the time I found the information out that I wanted to find out, I would not have the job opportunity anymore. So right. I cannot afford to go get that information. Right. Right. So sometimes, so once you say, well, yes, the information was available, but, but I couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. Then that does it. Then you say, okay, that's fine. Like, great. Hopefully you thought about that beforehand. If the answer was yes, it was knowable and I could have afforded it, but I didn't go look for it. Don't, don't stop looking backwards and only look forward and say how now I want to include that in my decision process going forward. So as I think about what are the things that I'm forecasting and thinking about and looking for, that will now be added to my list because it wasn't on the things that I was recording before so that you're actually always have a forward look on it. Okay, let's hit our last question. It's kind of related to what you're talking about. It's from Marty Cornish. And the last question asks, how do you create the records? I think this is the recording. Is it just an Excel spreadsheet with decision, date, reasoning, result, or Google Sheets or whatever? Like how, when you said you should write it down or record it, any favorite tools? Or so, problems? yeah, I mean, so and, I- And, and what, what, what should you record, I guess? And again, my guess is September 20th on Amazon. No. Yeah. So, um, so- Basically, there's. It, let me just separate it out into two things. If you're making decisions in a team setting and you're actually in, instituting a really good process, the, there will be a record produced automatically. That's mm -hmm. one of the nice things about uh, if you create a really good team process, you will end up automatically with a record. Because we think, right. go back to that hiring example. You have a hiring committee, you have four people. Mm -hmm. You've figured out in advance what are the things that we really want to be forecasting and what are the opinions that we want to be giving on this candidate? Each person is going to do that independently. And then uh, and then we're going to have a team discussion about it that then's good, then we're going to go ahead and, and make the decision. That's a record. Right. When you do a pre-mortem, when you say, okay, this is what we think the data is telling us. And then you say, okay, it's two years from now. Let's imagine that we were completely totally wrong and that's actually not at all the way that the world unfolded what do we think the top three reasons for that are and what's our rationale and everybody does that independently and you stick that again in a spreadsheet that now creates the record right so right. a it's really good team process is automatically going to create a record now right. when you're doing that individually you just have to just do it by yourself right and try mm -hmm. to try to really create these knowledge trackers so you can do it in an, uh, in a spreadsheet um, you can do it on Google Docs. You can just be journaling it. 
but you yeah. want to have something that you can look back to so mm -hmm. that you can see, you know, so how did the world end up versus how I thought it would end up. And so you can start closing those loops really well. It's interesting at Dream It when we decide about startups to bring to the program and it's it's tough to get in. There's a couple startups that are going through currently that are actually doing their investor sprints this week. They're meeting with investors. And one of them, a, several of them are just on fire. They've got a million meetings, they're doing so well. And I was trying to remember, what did I think of that startup when we were interviewing them? <laughs> and I went back, we used HubSpot and I looked at my notes and was like, I guess I called that one wrong. Was, but dream it, you know, we have a lot of experts, there's a lot of expertise, we make a decision as a team and then we decide and we stick with it. And I look, you know, it's very carefully written down that I was not so hot on this particular startup and, and, and I was wrong. I mean, you were wrong. And so, yeah. so that's another thing to think about, right? Yeah. Is that once you quantify it, right? So instead of saying, I'm not so hot, if I had forced you to say, uh, you know, on a scale of right. zero to five, mm -hmm. uh, how strong is the founder? What's the right. probability that they get funded at Angel or they get funded at Seed? Now mm -hmm. what happens is, let's say that you think that, that that particular company is 40%. You don't really care whether that company went on fire. What you care is that across all of the companies that you rated to be 40% to get funded right. at, at Seed, that right. you're you're sort of around there. And mm -hmm. if you're not, it means you're miscalibrated to the market. And then that allows you to go back and calibrate. Again, that's one thing that's so nice about this process is that you're mm -hmm. recording the no's. So right. you can actually collect enough data pretty quickly because right. you're actually making lots and lots of decisions. We only think of a decision as a yes, but a mm -hmm. no is a decision as well. And now you can actually see like when I think there's a 40% chance that that this company is going to you know, get an angel investor or seed right. or whatever. Seriously, you know, right. across those companies, do I actually get to somewhere around 40%? That now allows you to close those, that now allows you to close those loops. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Annie, you're amazing. Thank you for spending so much time with us. I didn't expect it to go that long, but you have great answers. You're very smart. And it's, there's a lot of people messaging me on Slack and dream it in the background. Like, oh my goodness, she's so smart. <laughs> and her examples are so great. So really enjoyed the discussion. Let me just wrap things up. And then if you want, we could chat later on a couple of things. I have a couple of intros I want to make for you, by the way, from, from some people we mentioned on the show. But anyway, let me, let me just wrap things up and go into it. So thank you again for your time. Really appreciate it. If we're going forward in the future, please catch our upcoming and past Dream It Live episodes really easy. Just go to dreamit.com slash live and you can catch our previous episodes. Please also check out our Dream It Dose on YouTube. We put a lot of pragmatic techniques. There are all these mistakes we see startups make again and again and we get a little frustrated. So we record these little five to seven minute clips. Um, you can just go to dreamit.com slash dose and you'll find them there as well as on YouTube. They're on YouTube. So again, Annie, thank you for so very much time today. Um, please stay well and be well during these challenging times. Have a great summer. And everybody, thanks for watching and thank you again. Take care.